Mein Hut, der hat drei Ecken. Drei Ecken hat mein Hut. Und hätte er nicht drei Ecken, dann wäre es auch nicht mein Hut. It's just the silliest song. With it translated, it means my hat, it has three corners. Uh, three corners has my hat. And if it didn't have three corners, it wouldn't be my hat. <laughs> so it's just, I don't even know where this song comes no, from. No, it was good. I was actually telling Angelina that the first time you were on the show, you did the techno beats. You did the German yeah. uh, techno beats. And that was actually really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, welcome back. Thank Thanks. you. It's, it's so nice to see you. I know you got a busy schedule and there's always so much to talk about. And even as we're walking down the hallway, we started talking about certain things. So yeah, I could I could mention three characters and we could just go right into it, you know, build 23. And yeah. then we start from there. But I, I mean, I want to introduce everybody first of all. So uh, Hans, how do you pronounce your last name again? Technically, it's Eich, but here I say Eich. Eich. Yeah. Okay, but it's <laughs> Eich. Okay. And then, uh, so, and it, to get a hold of you is Hans at Hans Eich, right? Dot so com. it's E-I-C-H, right? Yeah. Dot com. All right. So you're technically, I guess, a uh, consultant high performance building. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, so you, you you're our, you're the professor. You're the basically if we're stuck on Gilgan's Island, I'd be speaking to you to try to figure out how we get off that island. Yeah, I got to be careful with that because I'm not a building science or a dude that has studied this. I just have interest in that, and so I just read up on it. A small uh, so I try to approach great. approach it with a no BS thing. So yeah. I'm between somewhere uh, like the construction guys and the actual. Uh, guy with a lab coat the scientists the yeah, building exactly. science people yeah but your canvas is the building yeah right yeah, which is really important right so i, I want to just let everybody know i'm wearing schluter's shirt uh i got to do a small little shout out to something that i discovered recently because i know that i've had a lot of tile people on the show and um I don't know. I, I wear different shirts on every single show. I wear uh, everybody's shirt. If you got a shirt, whatever, it's got Hans on it, I'll wear it. I'll put it on, right? But I want to just pay attention to this. So it's funny. I had a tile guy, and we were talking about what what do you think regarding trowel size you would get more coverage? Would you get more coverage on a tile if you were using a trowel that was three-eighths high, quarter-inch gap, versus half-inch high, half-inch gap? And the tile setter said that you would get more coverage with the um, three-eighths. Or sorry, the half inch. And then I said, well, I was told that the three eighths because you got a higher ridge and a narrower gap. So when you push the tile down. So this was uh, something that Todd showed me because they've actually calculated it. So if you break it down, there's a formula that to calculate the space and the ridges over 20 open segments. And so if you look at uh, the first one at the top there, which is quarter inch by three eighths by quarter inch, you're getting 1.875 square inches over 20 open segments. Now, if you come to the next image, you're going to go to half by half, which is the second image or the second picture. Sorry. Where's the second picture? <laughs> oh, there there it is. Okay. So if you look at half by half and 20 segments, you're getting 2.5 square inches of coverage. So technically you do get more coverage on a tile surface when you have, because the theory is that you've got a bigger gap and when you compress it, you don't get as much coverage, but you actually do get more coverage. You almost get almost a full square inch more. Yeah, does does slump play into it? Well, because that's, if this wasn't fully compressed down, that's that's also another thing. And then you also got to factor into the angle of the trowel and everything like that. But it's still you're comparing two point five versus one point eight seven five. So technically speaking, because every tile setter has to decide what trowel do we use, yeah. and there is no mandate on the thickness of the mortar at the bottom of the tile. It's really about the coverage on the tile. Mm. So you can have two mil, one mil of, of thickness, but if it's got 80 to 90%, which is what you're supposed to have, then that's what you go with. But you're also, every tile setter knows that you're supposed to do a test. You just don't grab a half by half because the tile is two foot by two foot or whatever. You have to actually do a test. So I just wanted to just share that so people can see it and, and get a glimpse of it. And it kind of leads us to you because you're about diagrams, science, numbers, and all this other stuff. Yeah, I recently actually had to, I did my own little backsplash. So you have to figure this out, which yeah. trial to which use. Which is actually tricky because um, there is no clear, clear... There is no... Well, there is with TT Mac. You can speak okay. to them and online, they have all this information. Okay. But how many tradespeople or even homeowners or anybody with DIYers are actually going to pay attention to this? You're going to go into a store and they're going to just tell you, large tile, large trial. Yeah, but I'm not even sure if I would trust them. That No, I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't. Because he doesn't have skin in the game, the person that no, tells you. No, he's walking he's around. Not, That's exactly. all. He or she is just walking around. But I, I think it's valuable information. to, to And then, like, this, this was a variety. So I, even on these images, there's different notch trials, size trials. But there is a formula to calculate exactly what your coverage is going to be based on the trial yeah, design, cool. right? So it's very, and, very cool. And Dietrich, uh, uh, not Dietrich, Schluter does not. Schluter doesn't give you this because that's not their wheelhouse. Oh yeah, that's right. They right? are yeah, and behind actually, the tile. That's thank right. you for bringing that up because I've been on the fence about the new Schluter that is peel and stick. So okay. I haven't used it. I haven't touched it. I haven't tried it. But then I got an opportunity this week to go and take a look at it and try it out. And so now they don't, you don't have to use mortar anymore on Ditra. Uh, Ditra heat. So they have a peel and stick. So they figured out. Uh, a glue, an adhesion, and and the felt, and everything's different now. And it's actually the shear strength on it is stronger than thin set. So now you don't have to mix up anything. You could put it right down. It works on. You could put it down when you peel it, and you put it on the substrate. Um, you can move it around still. The mm -hmm. adhesion doesn't grab right away. It's the moment that you push it in. Once you push okay. it in, it activates the glue, and it makes it like bond so ridiculously tight yeah so they've done tests and it's actually stronger and then he was also mentioning to me here in north america they base their test on shear strength which is a movement of horizontal plane so pushing it one way or the other to a certain degree in europe they do it the other way around where it's a pulling up so mm, if you okay. pull up and they determine the, the, the strength of that bond from that so, so it's kind of interesting that both places are two different kinds of testing they're still getting to a certain number but the good thing is that they figured out and it took it took years and years to figure out what kind of glue and how to make it work and now it's peeling stick it's a lot easier and anybody that's been trying it i've been told they love it more than the thin set now do you know what the funny thing is about the name schluter was that it used to have the the umlaut on the yeah it did and then it took it off yeah that just disappeared i guess no, schluter it, yeah. is how you would say it. yeah that's technically yeah, how you would say it. i know <laughs> Very smart Very man. Cool that and so, one hundred percent orange. That's this is Schluter's weird. shirt on the back. You know, cool. That's the, that's what it is. So, I mean, everyone's got a bunch of swag from Schluter. So, I just figured, okay, I take that, and then I want to talk about that because I uh, I enjoy passing by and talking to the boys. And what's going on? Tell me, so then I can share and I can sound smart. That's why you're here, Hans. <laughs> <laughs> but so you, we were talking about Bill C-23. Uh, 23. So right. how it's, uh, yeah, it has been approved. It's moved forward. Oh, it's crazy. happening. And it's been, the green incentives have been taken out to fast track things. Okay. So I don't know. I'm, I'm like. So I'm, it's, it, it, the funny thing is I was, I just told you last night at around 11 p.m. I literally dropped off a letter to, to your my end. MPP um, because the, we received instructions from Passive House Canada. Uh, just you know subscribe to the newsletter then if you don't you know if you want to have your voice on that you know hand in your stuff uh, by the 17th uh, which is today and uh, i figured i'd do all this i'd wrote my i, I wrote all the the uh, the minister of housing steve uh, clark Stephen? yeah steve exactly clark, i know uh, and the whole shebang and it's it's kind of disappointing now and but i find that well it's the second time they now push through a bill much faster than what they even say they're going to do and you don't have time to respond to it and on the way here thinking about what can we even talk about um i realized i don't even know what the bill says there and was a couple of people that sent me specific paragraphs and i was actually talking about it on the show when luca was here from the ontario home builders association yeah. i i i actually specified specifically what this person who sent me this email uh the points in the bill and, and um, Luca was, was kind enough to say, I'm not really familiar with that section of it. And it's not really his responsibility because he's not the one that has written that bill or been a part of the bill. But he is associated with what the Ford government is doing and yeah. what Steve Clark is doing and like the Ontario home. That's that they're all in the same wheelhouse. Yeah. So he they've all been kind enough to publicly say we endorse it. We approve of it. This is going to work. This is a great plan. Yeah. Well, where I was trying to go with this was that. um I I have received the summary from Passive West Canada okay. um, on what this bill is going to do, what is very likely going to happen, but I never ever uh, verified that in the bill. And I went to the bill, and it's eighty no seventy eight pages long or something like that. <laughs> and I, I I don't have time to read that stuff, and it's probably legalese, and so it's just being washed over our heads. They yeah, it's get not the media really soundbite out there. Tell everybody yeah. that we're doing a job. Yeah. Make I'm pretty you sure you happy. could have sold me on this bill on the opposite direction too if you had just worded it differently. So it's it's. I think they were trying to figure out like their big thing right now here in Ontario. We had half a million immigrants come in, 
this year. Mm. right so a big chunk of them you know they're all coming into this country so now there's uh we need homes for this stuff but that doesn't you making this bill and you streamlining what you say to speed things up is not going to make homes build faster and you getting rid of the yeah. green initi initiatives that's not going to make it go faster. i mean everybody's so busy in the industry yet it, yeah you can even if you change that it doesn't make us work faster so i mean i did have a wager with uh luca there so i'm gonna enjoy my steak dinner at the end of 10 years when i go knocking on his door whichever he's probably gonna still be at the ohba and uh i'll uh, we'll, we'll head over to harbor 60 and uh because they won't reach the goal i guarantee you they won't what's their goal 1.5 million homes in the next 10 years we were okay. just under 800,000 in the pre in the and, last 10 years and the issue that Passivos canada had with us and i'm just going to reference them sure, because that's sure. where i have my information from is that it will very likely lead to um, um, degradation of the quality of the That's houses. what I said, and he didn't agree with it. He thought that, no, 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 it's, it's going to be policed. Does it not very specifically lax code? Not code, no, it not doesn't. Code. It just, it just it streamlines the permit process and the land acquiring process. Okay. All, a lot of the paperwork, that's what it does. It streamlines that so okay. then you don't have to wait years to get approval for zoning or for permitting or for any of that. Stuff. They think by doing that, you'll speed up construction. And, and, but why would it now, um, why is quality of the houses affected? They don't think quality will, uh, why is the quality affected? Yeah. Well, with the green, you're, you're getting rid of your, your, basically backtracking what we've been trying to do better and a lot of young builders are very yeah. conscious of all that stuff yeah well there's i've now noticed that there's two aspects that there's really a whether a house is sustainable or whether it's built well are two, it's two different things yeah different things and so that's why i'm kind of digging around in there i some people may sound it's way too obvious, but I always try to understand the behind the. I'm always suspect of any politician, right? I just like it's if they haven't swung a hammer, if they haven't been on boots on the ground, they don't understand what really is entailed to to pull off what you yeah. need to pull off. But if you know how to create the right soundbite to get media coverage yeah. for it, that doesn't really solve the problem. But we, uh, as a construction industry, we're not really helping ourselves no. right now no. because within the industry. Um, I hear lots of complaints um, from builders, uh, from What are some of the big things that are coming out that you're hearing? Well, it's that nobody, nobody takes the time to really finish a job properly. Uh, and that um, we have way too many delays because there's too much work out there. Guys are scheduling way far out. And I think because of that pressure, people don't, uh, or uh, trades may not... Um, may not finish a job as clear cut as properly as they should be because you got to get people inside the house so then you can finalize the job and then you can get paid your final bill it's yeah money. money's driving it right and everyone yeah, like, yeah it's i agree yeah the recession coming on so it yeah it is a big big crunch right now but i do see i agree with you that you're gonna see a lot of i i think that it's p poor built homes because they're going to be pushed faster just to get it done. Yeah, we're already seeing pretty poor quality. Kinda I think we talked about yeah, this like, last time. You, you, you probably remember, um, oh man, the Michael Keaton movie about Japanese coming into America and building cars. Gung-Ho gung or something like that? No, I don't know. So, the, uh, man, I'm trying to remember it. I, I'm pretty sure it's called Gung-Ho or something like that. The whole point is that the Japanese wanted to come here in America, but they wanted to use American workers, right? Okay. So they weren't building the, the cars fast enough. So then all of a sudden there was an assessment coming from Japan. All the big workers are coming into America now to look at the cars and they quickly to hit a number. They had to hit a number by the end of the movie that we achieved this so we can prove that this is viable here. And I'm bringing this up because it's like, I can see this happening, them trying to get to 1.5 million homes. So they were literally building cars that were missing parts and missing things. They looked like they were a completed car, but they weren't. And then when the executives went closer and touched it, things started to fall apart. And mm -hmm. so they technically reached the goal, but they didn't build all the cars properly. And yeah. that's what I see potentially happening here yeah. with this. So what's the point of that? I don't care if you reach 1.5. If you got half of those homes are terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that really scares me is, um, I'm just going to point out an area, just north of Toronto, all those big um, the make developers. Mansions. Okay. Yeah, they make mansions. Um, I mean, the size is an issue for sustainability. Um, but 
just also how lax they are on quality. Um, where the, the yeah the dynamic is really complicated. I think if um, we're building these expensive houses, uh, people get just right to the max of what they can afford um, to buy these houses. Um, but seeing how poor some of that quality is during the construction process before it's covered up in brick, um, it's bound to have some problems eventually. And so it can start in another 2008. Um, if we have a house that, that just rots out, um, it can cause, it, it, it will now lose value. That person who is just able to pay its mortgage on it, now the house is underwater, um, figuratively, um, um, and it can kick loose a panic. Other people are like realizing, well, my house is built the same way. Um, now the value is lower than the mortgage, and I'm actually paying on it. Uh, they can't sell it, or they or they they get foreclosed on, and it it can you think keep that loose that'll them. potentially happen? Like, no, I really hope it doesn't happen. But I, I don't I don't but see it, homes of today being century homes. No, they're built for how long? The, the exact period of the mortgage. That's what they're built for. Well, I, I, that's sort of what. So they start structurally or like majorly start to fault after that period. So a 25, 35 year. That's somewhere that range, I'd say, yeah. To, I mean, to a German, that's a scary number. Yeah. Um, but I think that's sort of the reality. It's of realistic. I yeah. I hear of a lot of problems during the Terry on already. Uh, I recently talked to a builder who has Terry on and he was, he told me that. Uh, they're discouraged from finishing the basement because of how many potential water issues there are. And so it's just, yeah, I don't see... So it's built to code. It's built to code, yeah. But they're still nervous that it's going to fail. Well, statistically, the basements have, according to him, the most failures Yeah. Um, as far as water uh, intrusion and whatever else happens in there. Um, but to you, the basement is one key component. In, in a structure when you're building it. Yeah, of course. Well, so, and they're, they're encouraged to not finish the basement because... The risk. It, the risk of involved with uh, any any problems due to uh, workmanship that has not been... But right executed. now, OBC, basement-wise for waterproofing, is your weeping tile mm. at your footing and a spray-on weatherproof or waterproofing membrane yeah. and then dimple board. Yeah. That's the extent of it. See, the, the tricky thing is, me being on your show is, um, I know a lot of, well, this is mainly tradesmen listening, I presume? Yeah, mostly. Yeah, exactly. There's homeowners listening. And there's tons of really good guys out there. Of course. Um, but to kind of throw everybody into the same pot and you say, can't. hey, this... You can't. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, it's, a really, it's a really complicated thing. Um, I hope that every tradesman has pride in the work. Uh, that they do um but and and when i do talk to them they are they all sound you know they want to do the best job ever but then actually seeing what is happening out there uh, i can tell that no some of the stuff's just it's not being followed through right exactly but is that because like we you said earlier it's the scheduling time crunch like technically speaking they're only given so much money and so much time to do the task but it's still it's the whole it's the whole big picture. Okay. So I can't just blame the worker on that. Technically, it, coming back to the Japanese um, and how they manufacture with lean manufacturing Toyota style. Yeah. Um, it's it's the whole process. Um, they stop the the manufacturing line if there's an issue anywhere on the entire line. Yeah, they do. To try to figure it out. So really, when we see a house that is that has the insulation that is half broken off and there's probably air leakages and stuff like that. We should hold the whole process and say, how can we fix it? And it's not just blaming the guy on the tools. No, it's not blaming the insulator. It's not No, we should go back and say, hey, what, like, did we provide you with the wrong material? Uh, can we make this easier on you? Were you working in adver- adverse weather? Um, are we putting you under too much pressure? Are we the, maybe not paying who, enough? Who's, Whatever. Who's going to do? And if you do do that, Hans, if you show up on a site and pull out a yellow card, like something's gonna happen to you, man. Like you can't do that, or how do you do that? I guess. Yeah, I mean, the whole industry needs to pull up their pants and say we actually need to deliver better. That's the other issue. You're doing wrong on the homeowner that pays so much for these houses. They're nowadays. expecting it should be a good quality house. 
but are we or like i've always said that okay sure homeowners are paying an insane amount of money nowadays especially here in canada for homes but i don't think that they're getting the quality that kind of connects to that price tag yeah. but they wouldn't be able to afford the true price tag that if you were to build it properly it'd yeah, be I think, higher i think the the entire industry needs to see this as a challenge and put their heads together and figure this out how um, any suggestions uh, well <laughs> Um, where does it begin? Where do you begin with that? We have a housing shortage. We have a uh, land shortage, I guess, so to speak. You know, yeah. you've got uh, people who can't afford. You got rates going up. You got inflation. Like, it's just like you've got this perfect storm just a brewing right now. And we're waiting for it to basically offload. Yeah. And now you've got it, the tradesperson in the middle of all this. Yeah. So I think the first thing that we need to do is to and this is going to sound really dumb in this situation. No. So we need to slow down, take a deep breath, and actually kind of look at, you know... What is the problem? What the problem is. We're so stressed out. There's so much anxiety out there. Um, that's on everyone. That's not just in the construction industry. Um, we're trying to work our butts off trying to pay for these mortgages and houses that are going... It's just the whole life has gone yeah. so fast. Yeah. And we really should reassess and say what's the main what's the most important thing our families safety um that we can put food on the table and that we love each other and oh. then oh, yeah and we don't need these big big mansions that are oh, I, ob I, above I, our i agree with you these homes are being too big built too big uh maxed out uh based on uh obc or, or zoning rules right when you should be smaller homes we we've all grown up on smaller homes you, you're yeah. from europe so you you see that's just a man that's just how it works right yeah. but i think that you really think homeowners would listen to you if you sat there and go listen when you finish your mortgage when you finally pay it your house is going to start to really fall apart yeah i mean i don't know how many homeowners realize that yeah well most homeowners don't pay the real cost of um, the quality or the lack of quality of that house. No. Most of them will purchase that house. Um, if it's new, then they'll get crazy incentives, buy it cheaper. It will have increased in price by the time they move into it. And I don't think they'll live in there longer than five to eight years. So the, there's, yeah, these days, but I think problems. that people are going to stay longer now. But they, yeah, have hopefully. Choose, they have to choose the right race, you know, the race of a horse, right? So yeah. hopefully you bought a good house, a nice house, a house that's going to last. Yeah, but how are they going to judge that? They won't be able to tell because everything's going to smell and look pretty. But yeah. we're talking about stuff that's not the aesthetic. We're talking about other stuff that's inside the wall. Yeah, exactly. Which is huge, right? Um, yeah. I live in a 1932 house and it's still going strong. Um, it's very small and, I mean... Um, it's great. It's 1,200 square feet. The, even if I doubled that, I'd only be at just over 2,000 square foot, which is a, a moderate house in today's standards. We're looking at 4,000 square foot houses most of the time. And so uh, actually there's, there's a key. Why don't we just reduce the size of the house but keep it at the same cost? Keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. Keeping up so, with the Joneses. But there so are, nice. so I, I guarantee you there are ways of of improving uh, the industry. There's there's so much untapped potential in producing houses in a prefab way. Um, it it's it's just engineering. I agree. I totally agree. I'm, I'm looking, looking forward to process. having Paolo, who's the inventor of Boxable. You know about Boxable, right? Yeah. So he's going to come on the show and we're going to chat about it. Yeah, very cool. Because I'm very impressed with what he's been doing with that, which is a prefab, literally unfolded. Your house yeah. is ready to go. And I don't even know when we talked the last time. Um, but I used to do that as well. Yeah, you were working um, on those projects as well. You were working on um, assembling full structures. Yeah, correct. I don't know about the whole, it was wall assemblies, right? Yeah, we were building, uh, yeah, it was only the envelope. Yes, yes. Uh, so walls, windows, siding, um, yeah, everything else was then done by others. Um, but even back then, I was only scratching the surface of what is possible nowadays. Okay. Um and it is not, it's not an easy shift. Um, I think the homeowners need to demand more. Um, yeah. I mean, here's a question for you. Is, 
Can you, as a builder, be profitable building green? Hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one. See, that, that well, you have to. So, first of all, you have to be profitable. Yes, because you shouldn't just design something and then price it too low. Yeah. Um, I mean, I work mainly with high-end houses, high performance. Um, they green, green. Whether it's built green or not green environmentally friendly or not environmentally friendly doesn't even affect the price that much at that point at that point when it's new construction no also the style of houses the size of houses doesn't even affect it that much i'm pretty sure you could switch um and make that house uh, probably well they're they're most of them are built quite well um i do have beef with with certain products that are in these houses that could be replaced Cer certain methodologies that could be switched. Do you want to swear? Do you want to share them or what? Want to, or no, that's going to create a can of worms. No, you can't um, share them. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't worry about it, Hans. I, I want to ask one last question about well, political. I, actually, well, what I would always... Um, I, I try to use advocate um, for the underdogs of green products. Rather than bashing others, I say, hey, why don't we just look at this one? Yeah. This will do the same job. Uh, we can do it um, financially um, uh, competitive. And so, yeah. Let me ask you this. How many, because right now green is trendy and a lot of big corporations are getting trendy with green. Mm. What percentage do you think all these new green products coming out on the market are actually not as green as they are presenting themselves to be? Yeah, I think the last night, again, I was on the, uh, following along at the Passive House Accelerator, yeah. a show uh, for just fans of Passive House sharing projects and what they do. Um, th we're starting to look a lot closer at embodied carbon in materials. Okay. Um, and that if that takes off, then um, we should clearly see who are the, um, which products are greenwashed and which ones aren't. Got it. Um, and so, yeah, I actually, uh, I don't know if I want to open up this can of worms No, here. no, leave it alone. Leave it alone. The last thing I was going to say, you also know that Ford got rid of the electric car um, credits, right? To, yeah. to install that. He got rid of that completely. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have to go back. Um, I have to go way back to 2012 or 2013. Kay. I used to work in... Um, in in solar the, the solar industry building large grid tied solar farms yeah and that only worked because it was really um, massive incentives and all the big uh, players came in but I noticed that the government was just pulling the plug or the rug out from underneath that industry and that's when I realized if uh, green technology or environmentally fr friendly technology um, is only possible due to government subsidies then it's never going to work it's never going to work yeah um and so that's when i realized i needed to look for something that even without incentives uh can work and that's when i found higher performance homes and i'm still of the opinion of that we need to um it needs to carry itself whether or not there is somebody supporting it or not it's all voluntary anyways even um houses that are built better than the code that's voluntary. Yes. Um, and so it really starts at the person that pays the buck for that house uh, that is going to do the right thing in their mind. Whether or not they're m now manipulated by, by greenwashing is another thing. But I think um, we need to now um, sell innovative solutions, uh, sell them honestly, and then let the, um, the market do the talking with the money. Um, how is a homeowner supposed to navigate through this whole world? Because I can only assume that they're just like overwhelmed yeah. by who's saying what and where they're getting information. I'm sure if you Google green, greenwashing yeah. well, or green anything. Maybe we do need to piss off some people. Um, and so even us talking around the hot topics and not mentioning them yeah. is maybe part of that problem. The problem yeah. But education is a big one. Um a clear message of those that are building 
uh, quote unquote proper. Um, um, but education to the tradesperson itself, like changing your tool arsenal and your tool belt and technique and figuring out how can I be efficient with this new product, this new technique and, and not always being held to the way it was. Like homes yeah. have dramatically changed it's, in the last 10 years and you need to adapt as well as a tradesperson. Oh, yeah. Right? It, it's everybody out there. Yeah. You got to educate your and it's show and tell. It's not just um, show I'm and talking un- about show and stuff. understand. Yeah, exactly. Right. The one super interesting thing um, f- in my own life recently is I bought a an air quality monitor. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, a cheap device I can connect via Bluetooth. Um, and in my house, I was always under the assumption great air quality. It's off gassed. It's used very little uh, glues and. Um, uh yeah did you fully renovate your house like you did so i renovated it um 16 years ago i was not in the industry yet so i didn't know i very likely would have renovated it quite differently um although there aren't too many things that are probably based more on obc standards at that time like staying within the guidelines right well it was not um insulated at all so i i stripped it on the inside just insulated it uh brought it up to code okay um what did and the air quality tell you? Yeah, the really interesting thing is um, I actually have no issues um, apart from CO2. Okay. And I didn't know. It's a very leaky house. So um, if you do a blower door test on this house to check, you know, how much leakage there is, um, it is somewhere around the eight air changes per hour. Okay. Um, as a comparison, a well-built, measured, and actually you know, paid attention to detail kind of house nowadays should be at 0.5. Yep. Um, Seven. Seven? No, 1.5. One, okay. One, so mine's at eight. It should be at 1.5. Passive house goes all the way down to 0. 0.6, uh, which is extremely tight. Um, um, but OBC is, um, isn't it 2.5? Yeah. Does OBC even Well, say? it depends on if you choose, uh, what is it, uh, 2000 or... What's yeah, the an R2000? R2000. Yeah, so there's different standards yeah, that stipulate. That's you have to choose types. which direction you're going to go with. Yeah, it's somewhere between 1 and 2.5, depending on yeah. what you're looking at. Um, I'm four times as high, and the assumption was always, oh, if with a house that is this leaky, you shouldn't have any problems with, with your indoor air quality because it all dissipates anyways. And so I found out now that during the night... Um, we, d- we do have tilt and turn windows they're 30 years old or 35 years old um, so they're not super terrible windows um, but during the night we have our CO2 levels go up to 2.2 no, 2200 parts per million um, our um, atmosphere sits somewhere around five to 600 right now um, and during the day yeah, I mean, in the city, okay. just outside in fresh air. Um, the dangerous levels start at 1,000. Uh, starting at 2,000, people say you get into headache uh, territory. So at night, in in our bedroom, with just uh, whether the door is open or not, doesn't actually make that much of a difference. I get into headache territory already. Wow. And so where there's... I see that VOCs aren't an issue unless... The monitor sits too close to my uh, my wife's um, doTERRA oils. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's quite interesting. Um, but yeah, we, we make a lot of assumptions about our houses and we don't know whether or not the so quality is there. Where is it coming it's, from? It's just too tight. There's not enough fresh air. That's I don't have, uh, okay. there's no air in this house. You're, you're, okay, so there's no It's age. a forced area. Okay. And so, but where I was trying to, get at is it's actually fairly simple to just show um what the quality is if every house came with one of those monitors and is it expensive how much this one i paid 200 bucks for it's not crazy exactly okay. you wave your hand in front of it it just it is either shows you green light orange if there's something fishy or red if it's bad air quality um and that's the show and tell part you can talk about the quality all you want but you should show, why don't you provide one of those monitors free with every house you build? That would actually be very interesting That's to see. That's a great idea. Um, it measures radon, VOC, CO2, uh, temperature, and humidity. Every real estate agent should do that. 
Yeah. They're and but I'm pretty sure they would be scared because they probably don't even know themselves. <laughs> and and even though I I, I agree. With I'm you. in this topic all the time. Yeah. I didn't know about my own house. But you so, wanted to know, so now you know. Yeah. And what are you doing to uh, can you change anything or well, I have the luxury that I used to sell an HRV brand um, yeah, quite a few years ago, and I have a unit left okay. uh, that is just kicking around in my basement uh, that I had, don't have hooked up. Now I'm trying to figure out how to. how can I just... Um, I want to do it quick and easy to, to experiment with it. It should definitely um, clean up the air. Oh, by the way, uh, since I've had that unit, I've slept with an open window. Because there's always been the assumption that if you just ventilate twice a day, that's going to be fine. Is it? Um, no. It actually just, if for a brief second, you see it dip down, but then the... the Once you seal the house up back up again, it goes right exactly. back to where it was. So I've actually slept with the window open for the last two weeks. And even last night, I just checked this morning, uh, it only went down to 18 degrees Celsius. Um, with the window fully open or just tilted? It, it's it's just tilted okay. and it has the curtain in front of it. But it keeps the the CO two levels um, at a healthy Safe. level. Yeah, but yeah, that knowledge I never had that. Let me let me oh, a little break here on uh, history. So solar history, you probably know a lot about this stuff. Uh, humans are, have a ra um, harnessed the sun's power for thousands of years, using sunlight to start fires, heat homes. Uh, a number of breakthroughs occurred over many years to lead to the creation of solar panels. You still a fan of solar panels? Hmm. Yeah, Takes I don't have any beef with them. Okay, no, no, I'm just curious. Uh, electrical generation could be increased by light. Cilium creates uh, electricity. Uh, first solar cells were made in cilium wafers. The first silicone photovoltaic, voltaic, voltaic, okay, PV, uh, were 4% efficient. That was the very first ones, right? They could power an electric device for several hours a day. Solar tech was first used in 1958 in space to power uh, radios of satellites. And the first satellite to run entirely on 47-watt solar array was launched by NASA in 1964. And I'm pretty sure Carlito probably had some hand with that with uh, PL using it on the space shuttle or something like that. He might have used that. Efficiency of solar panels has improved. Uh, the first cells were up to 80%, uh, sorry, 8% between 1954 to 57. Then it went up to 15% by 1960 by Hoffman Electronics. Uh, up to 20%, 1985, University of South Wales, up to 33.3% in 1999, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, and Spectral Lab, and then up to 34.5 in 2016 by University of South Wales. Again, the price of solar panels has also dropped uh, at least 10% each year. In 1956, it was about 300 bucks a watt. 1975, it was uh, about 100 bucks a watt, and now they can cost as little as 15, 50 cents a watt. This has led to over 1 million U.S. installations as early as 2016. Are we big mm -hmm. here in Canada with solar? Or is it a myth about the winter? Um, I don't see much in recent years. I don't see a lot of One people. One of the an annoying yeah. things is that we build all these solar-ready homes which just means that we put some conduits on the roof and that we can tie in, which is great, yeah. but we don't. Um, yeah, uh, by the way, I quickly wanted to backtrack a bit. Yeah. There used to be a really cool company in Toronto called Morgan Solar. They, um, so they developed a panel that um, was made mainly of plastic, a lens that focused the light inward to a high-powered chip, and that had really high efficiency are they as well. still around no unfortunately not i don't think they were able to get the capital to really keep it going maybe you but know this elon's with his solar power shingles yeah whatever happened to that i don't know he made the announcement five six years ago yeah built those four so homes it, the i like solar solar is pretty sexy okay um but what is much more price effective is to actually build a more efficient envelope and I once made the math. I don't actually know how I came to this number um, back then. I tried to really figure out um, if uh, uh, the cost for a saved kilowatt, so one that you don't waste on your house, yes. was roughly 10 times cheaper than the generated kilowatt on your house. So if you're... Based on a house that's built properly. Or no? No, any kilowatt. Any, any okay. kilowatt that you save that you're not wasting. So 
let's say you're increasing insulation in the house. Yes. Um, the kilowatt that you're saving there is 10 times cheaper than the kilowatt that producing. you're using. It, it very likely has come down because solar has gotten the more cost. efficient. Um, that's a big number. Huh? Like, honestly, that's... Right, so technically, in I, I really like net zero houses, and I know we can build that way. Um, we just got to put our heads to it. But it starts with reducing our energy consumption, and then we add electricity to it. So... Because at the end of the day, you can technically take a tent and make it net zero. Tons of energy lost there, but you put up some solar panels and you probably keep it hot um, as long as it's airtight. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, How I do think we the smarter way is to actually build the better house first and then add generation and uh, and probably storage to it as well. So what's the number one component to reduce our consumption? Size of the dwelling, right? Or yeah, is it size of the dwelling? Size of the dwelling. Um, air tightness has a huge effect on uh, on it. That's technically your cheapest way to save energy. Uh, everybody should be building airtight. Uh, all the materials are there. They may not be installed Correctly. properly enough. Yeah. Uh, and then the next thing, whether well, it's orientation. Um, so where do we get the education from? Where does are you expecting tradespeople to just go online and you no. got to navigate now? You got to navigate. No, because the tradesperson is not the one that makes the decision. It's, it's the designer. Yeah, it's the builder. So yeah. it starts with well, the homeowner needs to make the decision. I want to build that way, um, and then does the the designer needs to now make that decision? And we we overcomplicate things so dramatically. If we go back to Harold Orr, the guy that built the Saskatchewan Conservation House. Yeah, back in the 70s, was it? Yeah. So? yeah. Um, he had a fascinating interview two years ago with Passivos Canada, and he simplified it. He just says, just do more insulation. It's paid for itself many times over. Um, do a simple house, build it reasonable. Um, let's not overcomplicate it. So when you say more, you're doubling the thickness of the insulation or you're double walling it you're how much more insulation are we talking about here yeah probably twice the thickness of twice the house, right okay. uh, of the wall so yeah do a double bat yeah that's i it. mean um there's definitely yeah uh, fairly easy ways to increase that and it does not increase uh, double the cost so cost wise though brand new let's say brand new home brand new proper home Whatever. Let's say the regular house is a million dollars. How much more would the other house be, realistically? Well, I'm going to challenge people and say you can do it at the same cost. Really? You just got to switch things around. Okay. Um, some key examples. And this is going to this is going to maybe irk some people. Doesn't matter. Um, I agree with you. Uh, by the way, I yeah. think you can. No, and passive house been, has been advocating for that for many years. They've always said ten to fifteen percent. But really, there's been people that show that they can do it at the same cost. Side by side. Um, yeah. There's always the question of ROI. Yeah. And then my first question is always, what's the ROI of your quartz countertop? You know, there's so many decisions that we make. But you make. can't take those things away from the client. That's the end user, like we said. They're yeah. aesthetic. We're inside the wall cavity. Yeah. So how do we balance that? So even if you present it side by side, equal costs. I, I still feel that if you go this route, you're not going to make as much money profitable wise. Yeah, I that's a different don't thing, right? So maybe that's why uh, I had to shut down my business in 2019. <laughs> so I mean, at, at the point when you give up the house and you go tarry on, I mean, you're long gone from it after two years. It's not your responsibility after that, um, and as long as everything's built properly and everything's fine. So now it becomes the homeowner's responsibility. Yeah. So I I mean. How many builders out there care what happens to your house after that period? How many do they care 10, 20 years down the line of that house? Well, I mean, there's good quality home builders. There out is, there is. That yeah. have um, but that extra multi-generational cost. You know, name on the line as well. Yeah. Um, but, but that extra profitability or the loss of profitability to give them a much better house that will not fall apart at the end of your mortgage. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, ju it's just yeah. an engineering Yeah. 
problem that we have. So Hans, walk us through. Like, how would you? I, I, there's techniques and certain things, and yeah. there's almost a basic grocery list of things that we can do to make it better. Uh, and and a lot of things that you've seen because you're always on site. You're always passing mm -hmm. by on site, and something could be written, drawn, and presented. But yeah. it's if it's not built on site properly then it defeats the purpose. You may have even cause more problems and then it becomes yeah. a worse build now. Yeah. So I would start off, um, we need to get a lot more comfortable with building our homes uh, digitally first. And we use computers. Modeling, modeling them. Mo not, not just modeling, but actually, we, we do use AutoCAD or whatever software out there, but to actually virtually build it, to actually sort out the details, we lose a lot of money on... Um, on guys just having to figure it out on site. On site. Um, I love that stamp. As per contractor. As yeah. per contractor. I know, it's always yeah. left for us, right? Um, then, um, yeah, there there certainly is techniques out there that will make it a lot safer. Uh, a proper rain screen facade uh, will, will reduce your risk dramatically. Um, we're probably going to have to play with size and complication of the building. Um, the simpler we make it, you know, we can then divert money away from very complicated details uh, towards um, more efficient materials. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's say flat flat roofs look awesome, but they're quite expensive. Um, can we somehow go towards a gabled roof and still make it look awesome? It's probably a cheaper roof. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a gajillion. But I guess the number one thing you start there. of is like the thicker wall assembly, which basically you get one shot at any new home or even a rental on how much insulation you can put in that yeah. cavity, right? Yeah, a lot of people are bothered by the thickness of the wall. Why? The window depth? The yeah, sills? Yeah, exactly. I don't think but it that's should be an issue. All these homes from Europe are like, that's how it, like even older homes... Stone yeah. homes, there you always you enjoy that looking yeah. at it. Yeah, I think we frequently give the homeowner a complete choice overload, and so um, yeah, we we really need to start seeing spec built homes built to higher efficiency, where the builder just says, "Screw it!" Out of my own moral. Um, I'm uh, missing the word here. Compass. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I want to build better and I'm going to make these decisions uh, and I know the homeowner will like it. It may not even be an issue for the homeowner, um, but if you point to it, they'll be like, well, that's weird. I want it differently. Um, but if you just present that to them and you say, this is just how it is, that is how it needed to be solved on a technical level, then... Yeah, I mean, uh, as long as you show them the advantages of it. On site, are you it. seeing more tradespeople interested in learning about this, or are you seeing more tradespeople that just want to get the scope done? Yeah, but they on? are under a lot of pressure. That's okay, um, yeah. And and it's it's complete overwhelm. Um, I think it would do a lot of tradespeople really well if they traveled the world and worked in their trade in other places. Yeah, let's um, get the government to pay for that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I see Germans come here. Yes, um, and uh, you know they they work here for half a year uh, on sites, and they see what do they say about people. ours? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what do they say about ours? Oh man, I was I was up north because <laughs> listen, the, the Germans they know a thing or two, right? Like they are building very so, well. Um, yeah, one <laughs> of the guys that I talked to, very smart guy. He's he's starting to be a structural engineer in Germany. Okay. Um, but he's also a, a, a journeyman carpenter. He came here and he just, he shook his head. He's like, one of the biggest things that, that he said right away is like, why don't we have standard details that are, that are safe, that everybody knows, we know how they execute it, uh, and we just do them. Um, there's a lot of engineering in there, um, but we share them across the industry and they become a standard and you just execute on them. And that, that every builder is reinventing the wheel for these details. And he said, why don't we have that? Um, well, you saw that traction on that social media post that I shared from you when you were just doing a detail of a flat roof with air 
and how it would work. And so many tradespeople were interested in asking questions and getting a better understanding of it. But yeah. that's not in OBC. That's not in any of our details that we have to pay attention to. Yeah, I think we need to get away from from even thinking... Just relying just on that. building to OBC. Yeah. Because it's literally the lowest legal limit. Um, and technically, the OBC isn't isn't that terrible. Um, it's safe-ish. Because I building to higher performance, I always have to look at, is it does it meet OBC? Because there's certain things that I can't do that a German home builder, like let's say a German prefab home builder, is going to build a fairly simple wall. Um, they're going to frame the wall on the table. They're going to put plywood uh, as interior sheathing uh, for racking and vapor control. They're going to then flip the wall around. They're going to add um, wood fiber board to it. And then very likely a rain screen. It's a very simple uh, wall build up. I can't build that one here in, in Canada according to the OBC. Because there's a little s sentence in there that says all the insulation needs to be visually inspectable. Before? Um, after the insulation is, uh, is installed. But I... Um, yeah, if it's behind plywood, it's not inspectable to the yeah, But that inspector. for cost efficiency and the tradesperson and that scope of work, they have to build it that way and get it in there and submit it like they yeah. to move forward. Yeah, yeah. The, all I was trying to say is I usually check the high performance stuff that I work with against the code and usually the code is is all right. It comes down to um how how you interpret it, and I, so I recently built an addition on my own house with that exact wall build up. Okay, um, and I knew the moment I handed in my my permit, there was going to be questions, and the brain farting started almost immediately. They question everything. Uh, All yeah, the because well, the my my vapor control layer was not right behind the drywall, and immediately the inspector said, and this is just at the at the permitting stage. He's like, no, that's you're, you have that at the wrong location. And I'm like, no, 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 it's at the right location. You're not reading it right. Um, I didn't go down the road far enough. His, his next approach then should have been, no, well, the OBC doesn't allow it to be there. No, look at the code correctly and don't just think about what you've seen, um, what you're used to, but actually try to understand the intent of the code. Did they eventually so, do that? I just ended up hiring a building an, uh, an envelope engineer that to just sign signed off, off on, on it, it, right? And they were fine with that. Yeah, but to give you a cost, that was two thousand bucks for uh, this addition was one hundred sixty square feet. For me, this was a test to see could I use these materials in this build up, um, and obviously I ran into issues right away. You ran into building issues, so you ran into, uh, but I, the actual addition when you finished it. Did it do what it was supposed to do? Oh, it works fantastic. It's my it's my office. Yeah. Um it's it's a fairly it's actually moderately thick wall. Um and it works much better than the rest of the house. It's super comfortable. Actually uh, the forced air heating um that goes to that room overpowers the room easily. And even though that room encloses a um, a piece of wall that was previously exterior, th it actually has in aggregate better insulation than than the house, um, than that wall that was there before. Um, meaning that technically I need less heating now, although I increased the size of the house. Are you happy that the code now is asking for, what is it, R R6 on the outside or is it R12 sheathing? Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, they're asking for some sort of insulated material on the outside. No, no longer can we just put yeah. some sort of half inch sheathing or whatever it was, right? But they're asking for that. And then it depends on the part that you use, whether you got to tape it all up or whatever. But then you're still doing a two by six cavity and you're doing yeah. an R24 or R23. Yeah, somewhere in that range. Something like I'm, that, right? I'm not and then your, your poly six mil and then your drywall. Yeah. And that's the, the extent of it. The huge beef that I have there is that quite frequently we use a material on the outside that shouldn't be there. There's a lot of um, um, foil-faced insulation that shouldn't be there uh, from a 
from a building physics standpoint in Europe, it would be forbidden to use it. Um, we can technically build that way, but then we also need to adapt for it on the inside that we have the correct um, so why has drying our, potential. So why our code adapted it? Why have they signed off on it? You know what? I don't think the code actually technically allows for it. Okay. Um, because it, it, it states that the wall shall not have any condensation issues anywhere. Um, and um, it, it should um, n not rot. I'm not sure what the ex exact wording is, but it should. So in, in easy terms, it, it should dry out. Um, it should not accumulate any water in there and should not rot away. Um, I have actually called up one of the manufacturers of, these, of that continuous insulation that we put on the outside yeah. and challenged them on that and said, hey, why are you selling this stuff here? Uh, this is not this does not meet code. If I model the wall, um, it's called hydrothermal modeling, um, where you can check is there any issues with uh, with condensation. Um, there, I see issues if we use your your material, and they just got they just went silent after that. Uh, technically, the material that they're selling is made for uh, the southern states. And you can use that material down there, and it works. Um, you've, you're more concerned with overheating, with keeping the heat out, um, and they dry to the inside down there um, because we've got enough cooling on the inside, yeah. and de enough dehumidification. Up here, we shouldn't be using it in that matter. Um, but the, the um, product manufacturers in this case, they just, um, yeah, they're, they're fine to just sell it. Yeah, I don't know how they wash themselves clean with it. How does that whole process work? Is it literally like you got building lobbyists coming in and going pushing a product? Is that is that I don't know. I don't know this world. I'm yeah, assuming I don't know it either. So, and earlier I didn't, I wasn't going to open up this can yeah, of worms, yeah, yeah, okay. but I, I got huge beef in the last um, uh, Sab magazine. So the Sustainable Architecture Building magazine. Okay, uh, there was an article right at the end that was. Um, defending spray foam and they made some arguments about how spray foam has gotten a lot better and and it certainly could could be used in uh, sustainable buildings nowadays but the 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 facts that they used in there were they were kind of non facts for instance they showed how canada only has 2% uh, it consumes 2% of the world's energy um same with germany i think the us had three percent but uh, and he said look our country is so massive and we still only consume two percent i mean but the size of our country has nothing to do with it no you should be calculating it per capita and that actually took the numbers out of that calculated it per capita uh, in germany it, it, so i i compare germany us and canada and we all agree that Americans use a ton of energy. Yep. But if you actually make the calculation according to that thing in that mag uh, in that magazine article, the U.S. was using less energy per capita than Canada. But he he was using that as his argument, saying that look, we're actually not that bad. Um, but it was I don't know. Where was know. Germany? Germany was. Germany was using about half the energy per capita. Okay. Um, so compared to Canada. Compared to Canada. And the so U.S. was slightly under Canada, actually. And it makes sense because they're more south. Yes. So they technically have less energy consumption. Um, but to show, oh, we've, we've got such a big country and we, lose, we use so little energy. What was the connection to spray thing. foam? Because I don't, what has dramatically changed? Um, that was just kind of saying that um, we're actually not doing that bad in Canada. He was then going into um, embedded, uh, no, into uh, spraying ag uh, foaming agents. Yes. And I'm glad they've changed that and it's come down dramatically. But if you compare that uh, insulation material against, um, let's say, cellulose, yes, huge difference. Um, they, he also said, look, you only have to transport two gallons uh, drums of this material versus let's say half a truckload of insulation. So they're adding the carbon so he, print of... Of the tra transportation. But he never even looked at what energy went into making... The chemicals. The, the chemicals. 
versus the other one. Yes. And so it was such a silly so, piece. So and I have one sided argument. Yeah. And I've got, well, I don't understand how this article made it into Sad Magazine. So did, was there money that changed sides? <laughs> did Sab, I don't think that them, that money changed sides. That would just be I think too it's obvious. A big can of worms. <laughs> I think some, somebody of, because the, if you looked at who wrote the article, it was written by a sales rep of a spray foam manufacturer. I think he just approached them and saying, "Hey, you've got this article here. Uh, would you uh, would you publish it?" And Sab Magazine didn't turn on their common sense hat yeah. uh, hat and said, "Well, yeah, we're going to pu- publish it." That's what I'm saying. There's, I agree with you. There's got to be some sort of monetary. And so, and now I'm coming back to what I said earlier. If we actually look at em- embodied carbon in this, um, if somebody actually, it, it, all those ca- all these calculations have been made. By the way, you just got to look for it. Um, but clients are not going to look for this. Yeah, exactly. I just don't understand how do we allow for an article like this to get into a magazine that really wants to be, you know, setting. Did you standard. did you contact them and speak to them and ask them about that? No, I was going like, to post something on Instagram about it. Um, I was going to post it the day off when the magazine just, came out. You're just I'd, picking fights with everybody. Uh, <laughs> it was I was not, I, I still want to do it. I have so little time these days. No, I'm I know crazy with. But the ideas are just. They make sense, man. Like this, these are the conversations that are supposed to yeah, happen. But, and and I'm picking a fight with somebody that is technically on my side. It's Sad Magazine. It's not even an. If it was like some conventional construction magazine thing, then I understand it. Um, but with these guys, they really should be watching that better. And so, I want to ask you how can um, uh, hang on. Let me just do a little bit of OBC talk. Funny enough, uh, hot water piping insulation, uh, insulation around hot water pipes can reduce the heat loss. True, if we insulate all the hot water pipes. Yeah, it'll totally help it, right? And that occurs as hot water travels across distances. I know that we got rid of the whole heat water recovery stack thing, uh, but there oh are yeah, some good really? ones as long as you do it properly underneath the shower. And Why it did works we get rid of that? Because uh, the OBC was telling you that there was a certain amount of distance that you can park it, which defeated okay. the purpose of the circulation of that wall. By the time it got to it, it was already cold. It didn't make any sense. So there was no energy to capture to bring it back and then oh, you okay. reuse it. If it's right underneath the shower, it works. But in, in these homes that we built, there's no place right underneath the shower, not in every situation. And I, I keep mentioning a passive house. Um, but if you do a passive house correctly, you will actually look at your, you, you'll you have to calculate the runs of all your supplies, supply lines. They try to to build it condensed enough so that, let's say, you've got the bathroom and the kitchen facing the You're designing back. the wet areas exactly. very close to each other, so yeah. now you're having shorter It does make runs. sense to insulate it. And actually, actually, it makes sense to insulate your cold ones, too. It's the same purpose when it comes to when you go seasonal, right? Um, yeah, actually, for another reason. I had condensation on my cold lines yeah. in the summer. Summertime. That's um, right. And I had, like, I've, dripping. Me and mine, I've done both. Yeah. And I put blue and I put red tape around either one because once you insulate it, you don't know which yeah. pipe it is or what color uh, or what source it is. So then I just put the tape on it so then I know. And so what does the OBC say about it? So it's just saying that um, water may arrive at a tap at 40 degrees despite the hot water tank being set at 70. Vertically connected hot water pipes must have the heat traps on both inlet and outlet piping as close to as practical to the tank unless the tank has an inter- integral heat trap. Uh, the tank serves a recirculating system, uh, which is what a lot of people are asking for the masters now, right? Hot water outlet piping from a non-recirculating system must be insulated with a thermal resistance of at least RSI 0.62 for the first 2.5 meters. So they're only asking for seven feet of it. I guess that's from leaving the tank. So then I guess you're retaining so the heat. Then I, I always try to understand intent. I don't understand what... The reason is for just what I've been doing is I've as I've been renovating, I've been sealing, I've been insulating, I've been doing whatever I can because this is the only opportunity I'm ever going to get to do it once the walls are closed, right? Yeah. And then the last point: inlet pipe of a hot water storage tank serving a non-recirculating system must be insulated with a thermal resistance of at least RSI zero point six two again between the heat trap and the tank. Um, so I guess what's the purpose if you're only doing a certain area? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Why as not well. just do the whole run? Yeah. Well, th- 
a smart engineer is going to ask right away, is there more energy in, uh, in the insulation that we put around there? Um, That's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't know actually why it would be. Is this also with, with PEX? That's a good question. I, I'm not exactly sure. Or is um, this just about copper? I think this is just copper at that point. But now homes every day is everybody's uh, there's far and few that you would think that someone's going to be asking yeah. for copper unless you're going radiant systems and then you've got that whole V-spin and everything's all set up beautifully and it looks like a Rolls Royce on the wall there. Yeah. Then you're probably going full compressed. It's all probably compressed fittings copper. Yeah, uh, to I run don't even know. Yeah, but I've never seen them insulate. That's the funny thing is even those ultra high end homes where you're bringing in a service of four inches or something like that. And then you've got your pumps and you got all that set up. You know what was funny? So it said it needs to be 40 degrees Celsius at the tap. At the tap. It has to be reduced. Well, the code is also thermostatic. Is that, also, is that the maximum or is that the minimum? 40 degrees. It doesn't say if it's minimum or max. It's just an example. Oh, okay. That's all it is. Huh. You're going to look it up oh, now, okay. eh? <laughs> no, I don't. See, honestly, I don't care enough about it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I want? I find that the small construction companies are more passionate about building better, which means building greener and offering that to their clientele than mm. the big builders that maybe want to perceive that they're building better for the clients. Well, yeah. yeah. They are just money generation generating yeah. machines. Every they don't care, home. yeah, um, whether they're doing right by their customers or not. Um, I mean, they may say this. Um, I did once talk to a CEO of a very large developer in North, and I, I mentioned even just a little thing once, and he told me right away, "Well, we build, you know, it's well built house. We don't jib anybody here." I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." It's really just to meet to, uh, to make that mortgage payment to to, to tap into the sales of it, it's whatever it, opens up the wallet. Yeah, that's all it is, right? That's what I mean. In the end, as much as it, they might listen, man, you start as a hero and then you become the villain. Like it's just it's I, what happens. I lived in a condo right next to the 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 four hundred one at one point, um, and it was I think eight hundred square feet condo with one. 800 may have been even too much. 800 may have been counting the balcony. Um, but there was a walk-in closet. It's the dumbest thing. It was so tiny, but only for the spec that we had, you know, the sales spec. Oh, there's a walk-in closet. You couldn't build anything in because it was too tiny. Like, why didn't you just give me a little bit more space in my bedroom to put a proper closet along one wall? Um, I can store just as much in that. But they, there are so many things that were just... It's a sailing sale. sheet. Um, the words the, walk-in closet. Uh, the wall was insulated so poorly that I could hear. Well, we were lived. It was right next to the 401. Um, it's one green drive. People drive by it all the time. Um, it's these New York towers up there. Okay. Uh, uh, you could hear the highway if you put your ear up against the wall. And it was so loud. But it had a walk-in closet. It had the quartz countertop. It had the stainless steel appliances. All the things that take off, you know, so we bought it. Um, but the actual important thing, which was that it's quiet in there, didn't uh, didn't happen. What are some of the things that when you get on certain job sites that make you cringe? Either it be materials being used or techniques being applied. What yeah. are certain things that are just standard today? Oh, man. I, There's a can of worms. Oh, man. This is a knowing your audience. Um, You're not gonna it, offend anybody. Don't okay. worry about that. Everybody's awesome here. They build amazing. <laughs> it's it's no. somebody not taking their time to do the job properly. That's it. That it makes me so upset because you've now used the material. Um. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's really. <laughs> Uh, I feel like I feel, uh, you want to say something, but you don't want to say something. I get it. I agree with you too. It's just a shame. It's it's just, at that point. I've always argued at that point. It's gonna probably cost exactly the same and take exactly the same amount of time at that point. So why not just go this way and do it this way, and then it's actually done properly. Yeah. Well, technically, it costs a little bit more because that person will have spent a little bit more time beforehand. But, yeah. Yeah. 
but if you take in consideration the cost for repairing something if something happens then it may actually be cheaper to just do it right at first time do we have tools these days that we could investigate like are there well, i'm a so i'm a big fan of prefabrication okay um and because you've i think studied that would be intern like you you've set up a plan computer than an actual in a in a closed environment and then applied it in, yeah. in situations. So that would now um, we would st we could finally start get serious about um, lean manufacturing. Really dramatic improvements of quality. Um, it will improve the quality of uh, e even of the workplace for people working these homes. Um, it should I to my mind it should not increase the cost. Um, if everybody does it. Um, there's two ways to see prefabrication. We've got a few players in the game right now and they're doing prefabrication, but they're doing it to decrease the cost even more so by uh, while not increasing the quality. Yeah, um, That's the one type of prefabrication that we see commonly for all the big uh, uh, spec builders. Yep. But we also have, we can increase quality um, without increasing cost um so yeah no i got a question for you um i do love when the germans come here or any other people and i, I have conversations with swedish and they, they build they build really cool stuff i know and i i'm trying to get this guy will on the show because i want to talk to him because he's trash talk us quite a bit and i i have not disagreed with him us as who a canadian canadians sorry canadians okay. builders right so i i group myself in that right even though technically yeah i'm canadian but i'm portuguese but i respect how other countries are building has other have the other countries like the germans or swedes or anything like that have they looked at canada going this is a viable market why don't we come in here we come in here with prefab and we start building it or they've just said Canada's a lost cause. They don't like this is going to be a, a such a hard battle to do that. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Because I, I don't I, know if I, they've looked at it here. Have they looked at it like, okay, you know what? We can actually build structures here that will be the way we're building back here and profitable. Mm. Will it work? I think that so the the German market, I'm just gonna speak about them because I don't I'm I'm a big fan of some of the things that the Swedes do, but I don't know enough how the industry works yeah. up there. Um but the German market is dominated by a lot of really small carpenters. And when I'm talking about a small carpenter, I'm, these are maybe 20 to 25 uh, employee companies. Um, they will own big uh, halls. Like I'm talking about uh, 20 to 30,000 square foot facilities where they prefabricate the houses. Oh, wow. Um, and this is considered, you know, basic carpenter. Um but they don't have the the money or even the desire to come here because there's they're not a big corporation that is just there to look at oh can i make so much profit and how can i grow how can i grow across you know the pond um it's a, yeah do we i haven't seen their interest here but i think i think they should or somebody should consider it or or maybe they have I and mean, they just crunch the numbers and they just said this the is germans great. that i've seen come here that were the you know, those carpenters yeah they're all shaking their heads um so they landed had a few pints and then left and then basically yeah, they worked their six months here and then gone uh, the employees uh, the employers are super happy about them because they they deliver really high quality work yeah but yeah I mean, it, the market is completely ripe. Are we in Canada dictated by what, I guess, Canadian, or not Canadian, U.S.-based companies are developing? We get a lot of products coming from down south coming into Canada as a, a testing ground because we've got extreme temperatures here. I don't actually know. I don't know. I don't, I'm I just don't think asking. so. Are we I more dictated? European products are coming more here to Canada instead of your uh, Canadian or U.S. products. Right? I mean, we probably have a huge influence from the U.S. Yeah. But we also have a lot of really smart engineers here. And Canada prides themselves in good engineering. And I know Canadian engineers go all over the world. Yeah. And so I think we can just, we don't even have to look down south. They, they have different laws. I agree. They can do whatever they want. The building science is the same. I mean, it shifts with, with the climate. Um, but the building science is the same here as it is in Germany. It's just with different temperatures, different humidity settings and such. 
um, that we have to adapt to. Um, so, I don't know. I see ourselves really as an island, mm-hmm. and we can, with what we have here, we can, we can do much better. Um, I don't need innovations to come f- from the the U.S. or I don't know. Maybe some manufacturers come up here with their products and they try to sell us on it. But I, I do have beef with one a product uh, that I'm definitely not going to mention here. Why not? Right now? Mention it after the mic. Um, you tell me afterwards. Yeah. And then at least I know, right? So I've always joked about, I've had so many conversations off mic. And it may actually come from the US. But again, <laughs> that material is okay to be used in the southern states. Okay. All right. Well, um, you'll tell me later on. Yeah. But I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about, um, I guess, new techniques, new, like anything, what's coming down the pipe that you've heard of? I know IBS is coming up in January, the end of January, February. So I don't know. I haven't been to it since the whole madness of what's been going on in the world. Mm. But I mean, you are you're always doing so much research. And so I can only assume that you're probably hearing about certain things that should come to the market here. Yeah, I mean, anything? it may surprise you, but I actually, I don't do that much no? um, looking forward. Because I think we, we have... Um, We've got everything we need. We've got the recipe. Like we have yeah. what we need to do. I mean, I don't, I can, I don't, uh, how do I, how do I say that? Well, I, the materials that we've had last 20 years or 15 years or whatever, they're fine. Um, it's just a matter of applying them correctly. The I don't need something fancier and newer. Um, it, it's, it may even be unproven. It may even fail. So I can use proven technology from, uh, 15 years ago uh, building materials that we see we can see that whatever we built 20 years ago is still holding up strong it's still working why don't I just keep doing that I mean some technology is going to be updated um, but that's more on on the automation side of things um, but if if it comes down to the envelope I would go fairly um, uh, old school uh would properly build straight cuts, you know, double proper wall. Screws. Would you go double wall? Um, c- cost wise, it could it gets tricky. Okay. Um, there's definitely more wood in the walls that I would suggest being built, um, but not necessarily um, the traditional double wall thing. Um, insulation materials, you know, go conventional. Um, with those, you can then overlay more modern windows, um, some automation. Uh, I don't actually think we need to automate everything. Um, like you don't have blinds and everything and like that? that? No, that's no. just pure luxury. I, I don't I even think we need to automate lighting switches. Like, come on. I can just, just get up, click. Yeah. yeah, I know. Um, automate your HVAC system uh, to work nicely. But even even the system itself, I'd go fairly conventional. Um, but use automation on it. I'd put solar on it. Um, I would e- look at integrating electric vehicles with it. Um, one of the things that I don't understand is why Why do we add solar on top of a roof? Why is the roof not solar in the first place? Which is what Elon Musk was doing. Oh, whatever happened There's a Swedish that, company out there that builds, um, rather than doing your conventional European roof, which is this rear ventilation there, and then you put um, clay shingles on it or yes. or a metal roof on it. Instead of using the metal or the clay, they just use solar panels. I mean, you're you're taking some material away. Now the glass of the panels just becomes your roof. Kind of um, makes sense, no? Yeah, it's not doubling up on materials. I mean, it's, it's a very expensive panel, but you're not building the roof behind it. But it goes back to your argument earlier about the money that you're uh, depends on the envelope the money that you actually save from what you're not consuming yeah i mean yeah I, yeah i don't think solar will across canada it. who's building better is the west building better than the, the east or are we good here i'm assuming yeah, bc is bc builds better it's definitely building better okay um they have that the step code which i don't it's not here understand uh 100 percent um uh, yeah, but I guess they implemented everything because they were building 
they started adding seismic and they started doing all these other things to it already and you're getting into extreme locations. Yeah. I mean, the whole attitude over there is very different. It's yes. a lot more hippie. Yes. Uh, they want to, yeah, they want to build for longer term. Uh, they do have very, well, if you go down to Vancouver, very different weather uh, that they have to work with. Certain materials that we use here are, are forbidden over there. Um, like which ones? Yeah, sure. No. Um, or I'm not even sure if forbidden, or then at least not used at all. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, let's say OSB already pre-applied air barrier on it. Over let's call there. It that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On the outside, I don't think it's being used. Wow. Um, as far as I know. Um, well, but yes, this moisture. No. Yeah. Exactly. Drying potential to the outside. Yeah. Um, it's it's a little bit of a of a how do you call it when you chase the tail. Oh, you uh, do. You change one thing, then you need to change something else. Yes. And the next thing, it just becomes more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We're almost done. We're almost done. All right. We still got more. Uh, Green Book Talk. Temporary heat. Uh, fuel fired heating devices must be located and protected so they pose no risk of igniting combustible materials nearby. Are you still a fan of fully electric over any other heat source if you build the house properly? Even today? But, uh, you need a lot less heat. Um, so do, going electric is a good move? I would say so. Um, you you definitely can't do it if you build to OBC. No, because um, your hydro bill will be exactly. insane. My father-in-law's house, um, which is fairly well built in the 90s, uh, he already used two by six walls back then. Um, wow. He went from, I forgot what it was, I th um, I don't know if he had gas. Uh, no, no, no. He went from uh, just regular resistance heating, um, uh, electric resistance heating, to uh, a heat pump. And at, so certain months of the year, he had, I think, $4,000 of electrical bill in the winter. Eat. And then he, he went down to a quarter of that. Um, but, yeah, you... All that to say is, if you if you start off with a efficient house, um, you you can use electricity. I think you should use electricity. It's obviously going to be a factor of how the electricity is made. Um, in uh, Quebec, I hear it's mainly hydro. So you're yeah, like a lot of Quebec is electric yeah. heat. So um, their electricity is definitely the go-to. Then what would you do for AC at that point? You're doing wall ductless systems. Yeah, I mean any kind of heat pump. But then you still heat need pump technology. You still need a it. ventilation at that point for your HRV. You got to still circulate air, get fresh air inside the house, even though you're heating with electric, right? Yeah. So there's uh, you're creating more um, systems, right? Yeah, and um, there was a really cool article um, in, in I forgot what it was. Um, one of the quite uh, well known building magazines in the US. I forgot what it was. But they suggested that ventilation should all be sep always be separate from heating and air conditioning. Um, Reason if, being? Um, b because your, your heating and cooling isn't always on. So if you do the ducts um, uh, for your heating system, uh, you'll only, uh, well, your, your heating and cooling will not run on the shoulder seasons at all. Um, but your ventilation should be continuous. Oh, and yeah. so in order to create um, an efficient ventilation system, it should be separate from that. Um, but yeah, big fan of, of heat pumps. So this is all about safety. Sorry, this is safety about temporary heat on uh, situations. Fuel fired heating devices cannot be used in confined and enclosed spaces. We're all coming into winter now, so we're all using tarps and we have to heat certain areas. Uh, fuel fired heating devices must be protected from damage or overturning, so salamanders and everything like that. Fuel fired heating devices cannot restrict means of egress. Uh, fuel fired heating devices that generate noxious products of combustible must discharge them outside the structure. Fuel supply lines must be protected from damage. Temporary steam piping must be placed and insulated so as to not endanger workers. How do you want to wrap this one up, Hans? <laughs> Open up the can of worms. Say one thing. Don't worry, I'll bleep it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to I upset mean, no, everybody. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop on a high note. I know <laughs> we can do things. We just got to 
put our our heads i will say that together. the majority of the smaller builders like the the one-offs kind of speak or the small i don't know maybe five to 15 employee businesses right they're very conscious of it they really want to build better i should say the one thing uh we should upset more conventional thinking yes and just say bleep those homeowners that want to build make mansions and status products and i don't care whether or not you want to build well, maybe somebody else is going to build it but the home builders need to have the guts and just say Stand no up. i'm going to build something that is that is right that is good that is better and f yeah. those homeowners I that agree. want that stuff i agree um and yeah they that's will not your client build it and they will come find another client yeah. I, I gotta do let's do the 12 questions again because i'm curious about it's probably evolved with you you ready for this oh yeah i can't even remember this what is your favorite construction word um man construction work word i'm word. just gonna say hygrothermal <laughs> this is funny <laughs> what is your least favorite construction word <laughs> uh spray foam what turns you on in construction Prefabrication. What turns you off in construction? Uh, shitty workmanship. What's your favorite curse word? <laughs> it could be in German. Scheiße. <laughs> That's right. What is your favorite vehicle in the entire world? Ooh. Uh, I don't know. That, that, um, oh, man. There's so many good vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's popping up right now? <laughs> Uh, it would probably be an electric, I don't know, mini pickup truck or something. Mini. I think there's truck. a was it a Nissan? It was a pretty cool little. Like, a pickup thing. truck? The only pickup yeah. truck I know is the Hummer or whatever that they're launching. No, there was a a small company that came out with their first electrical, and it's a pickup. And it looked pretty cool. I don't know that one. Okay, what's your least favorite vehicle in the world? Oh man. Uh, I don't know, like wimpy little ones. So even though I'm a tree hugger, I love badass cars, and I'm what do you mean, an like enthusiast? Like, okay, like um, if you showed me a really cool looking Hummer, it's amazing, or you know, just off road adventure trucks and the, that kind of like stuff. The original Hummers, like yeah, those sure, kinds of things. All right, awesome cars. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't use them for commuting. No, uh, but use them for the purpose of being used. So get out into the wilderness and make it go up and down yeah, hills, there's right? my least favorite car would probably be that funny one that mr bean makes fun of with the three wheels that always tips over oh i know which one you're like talking that. about i don't <laughs> even know the brand is that what construction sound or noise do you love um ooh. uh planning or actually let's take it to the, uh, no um let's do a, a k2 uh hundiger k2 That'd be cool sound. Hundinger. That's it's um a CNC oh okay um, all right tool that will pre-cut all your your construction lumber. I that's did yeah, and then that's can, we can build that. There's a company. What's it called in? Uh, well, Hundinger is a manufacturer of these machines. Yeah, we is it Wiki, Wiki builds Wiki, Wiki builds or Wiki homes? They build a whole house in plywood, and it's all connected together. No fasteners. It's just yeah, they would have used a CNC. Yeah, to um, cut everything out, all the pieces, components. Yeah, but no, this is actually, this is a saw. Depending on how you outfit, um, it will have routers on it, saws. Um, but essentially, you take your, your software to f in order to build your house, and you just send it a cut list, and it can do all your rafters, bird's mouse, all that stuff. Everything. Everything. And in, in Europe... Uh, in Germany, most carpenters will have one of those because it's cheaper to, to do that than to pay somebody to cut your lumber. And it's always precise. Exactly. Very precise. Uh, what construction sound or noise do you hate? Uh, jackhammers. Because usually a mistake happened. <laughs> <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt one day? Oh, man, I would have loved to have been an architect. You can still do it. I attempted it and? a few years ago. Okay. Yeah, I left because it, I didn't have the time, but also the attitude is funny. <laughs> what profession would you not like to do? I mean, pretty much anything on dirty jobs. Oh, really? Huh? No, actually, no, that's not even true. Because there's some stuff that is 
That is cool. There's some interesting. badass guys on yeah, that show. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, They're not all bad, bad jobs. Hey, you know what? I have no idea. Probably There's working in a morgue or something like that. Uh, yeah. oh, but that's not construction. <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be construction. Okay. It could be anything in the world. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that one there. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near there. Last question. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? Well done. Oh, it's always a pleasure to see you, man. <laughs> Thanks so much for sneaking it in, get it in here, and and I hope that we ruffled a few feathers and uh, people people love listening to these types of shows because we we propose, think, question, yeah. you know, stand up. It's yeah. you should you should be to like clients to everybody else, right? Especially the politicians. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just they're good people though too. I mean, they just need to understand. You um, lost. You lost me at there. <laughs> I mean, if I, man, this opens up a can of worms. What's that? I had a fight with my father-in-law once. I said, you know what? Justin Trudeau is a cool, da- good, cool dude if I sit in a room with him a room with him, and I have a meal together and we just talk about family. But there's a lot of decisions I, I, I don't agree with. I still, I empathize with the person. He's uh, still he, a he's person. He's just not a good uh. decision maker and leader. Um, the decisions have affected the country for the negative. That's where it, I draw the line, right? Yeah. So but I always look at the person and I see what the motivation is. I, I don't know if there's so many truly evil people in politics. Like real, like actual evil. Evil? Not, like Dr. Evil evil? Like evil? No, where there's like psychopathic no, tendencies. No, Um, And they want to just like cause friction just because they enjoy that i like i, I said i everyone always starts as a hero and ends up as a villain so it's yeah. just especially if you're going to get into that kind of business yeah. it's super tough but that Somebody business is affecting it. us it's affecting all of us it's affecting the way we build it's yeah. i wish money wasn't just effing that whole thing up that's why i envy the animals on this planet yeah. they got it right <laughs> we got it wrong that's just me right <laughs> Hans, we are already here, man. Thank Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, bro. Good to see you. Thank you, Angelina. We are gone.